So I'll, I'll start out by saying that um, everything I'm going to present today is actually work of our APHL CDC postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Miriam Schachter. Um, lucky for her family, she had a baby three weeks ago. Unlucky for you, you're stuck with me. So um, I'm. Uh, this is just some exceptional work that, that Miriam has done to benefit the system, the newborn screening system in New Jersey. And following our two previous speakers, sort of single point mutation uh, descriptions pale in comparison to whole exome and whole genome sequencing. But I hope that by the end you'll see that um, what Miriam was able to do for our system uh, is really a, a huge step forward for uh, newborn screening in New Jersey. <clears throat> so, um, so galactosemia, so the work focuses around mutation analysis for galactosemia. I think everybody knows um, understands why galactosemia is part of newborn screening, but I'll sort of go over um, the, the pathway for the metabolism of lactose and galactose, which you show here. Um, lactose is clearly the major sugar in dairy products, and uh, while the talk will mostly focus on classic galactosemia, I want to point out two other defects in, in the processing pathway, and that's defects in galactokinase or galactoepimerase uh, enzymes. Um, these are not detected through the measurement of, enz uh, of enzyme, but rather by the increase in sugar. Uh, in New Jersey and many other states, we do um, mandate screening for galactokinase and galactopimerase deficiency, so you have kinase there and epimerase there. Um, but what we'll focus on for the remainder of the talk is um, classic galactosemia with defects in the GALT enzyme. And so when you have deficiencies in the enzyme, you have a buildup of galactose in the cells leads to uh, hepatic failure, hyperglycemia, kidney damage, um, and uh, rapid progression of the disease within the first week of life. Galactosemia, classic galactosemia, is characterized as a time-critical disorder. Um, and so reporting out of uh, presumptive critical results um, needs to be done in a timely fashion. In New Jersey, we screen for galactosemia six days a week. Um, basically, treatment is just removal of uh, the sugar from the diet. Uh, it's just diet modification. Um, clearly, there's a little bit more in terms of management of classic galactosemia patients, um, but, um, but if initiated immediately, the effects of galactosemia can be mitigated um, substantially. So um, in New Jersey, we screen for classic galactosemia by measuring the GALT enzyme. We actually screen for enzyme and sugar. As I mentioned, we screen for kinase and epimerase deficiencies, but if we're focusing on classic galactosemia, uh, measurement of the GALT enzyme activity is our primary model. In some states, uh, they measure t uh, the sugar. <clears throat> we chose GALT enzyme activity, and we use the perkin elmer genetic screening processor, the GSP, which you have here. It focuses on a 96-well plate format where we punch the dry blood spots in. And it's actually an indirect measurement we're not actually measuring GALT activity. You have a substrate, uh, the GALT in the blood cells break down the substrate, and then you have a variety of other biochemical reactions and you measure uh, fluorescence. Uh, the cutoffs for our, this assay that led into the work that uh, Miriam performed was, um, and I, I, I sort of left it unitless uh, because the vendor perkin number puts sort of this arbitrary unit measure on as a measure of fluorescence, it's units per deciliter, but I, I dropped the units because really the value is what's critical for the remainder of the discussion, and that is any value greater than 4.4 was, was a normal result. Um, no, follow -up, no further follow-up action was necessary. We have a borderline category where GALT enzyme is reduced uh, below the normal level, suggesting something might be amiss, but not necessarily critical, requiring an immediate follow-up, and so we simply request the repeat specimen be submitted to the laboratory within two days. And then ultimately, we had a 3.4, which is our presumptive level, which was immediate connection with a metabolic specialist, um, uh, as well as switching to uh, non-dairy-based formula. So oftentimes, if a child is breastfeeding, cessation of breastfeeding, continue mom pumping breast milk while the diagnostic workup is performed, um, and then switch to a soy-based formula. Largely, that works as long as the baby is not allergic to soy-based formula, which we did encounter in New Jersey uh, not too long ago. So the problem with measuring enzyme, uh, whether it's galactosemia or now that we're venturing into lysosomal storage disorders and looking at enzyme, is there are a variety of reasons why there could be false positives. Um, first is environment. Enzymes are labile. So heat, humidity, especially in the summer months, um, can contribute to false positive results, artificial lowering of the enzyme activity. Um, you also have carrier status. So a child might not be 
um, uh, um, have two pathogenic mutations, but a carrier status can reduce that enzyme level that we detect. And that includes the variant Duarte. Um, so we, we're typically measuring for classic lactosemia. There's a, a common variant called the Duarte variant, which also can result in diminished um, GALT enzyme activity. And I would say that, and I know I'm in a room full of uh, metabolic geneticists, but uh, with all due respect, you, you debate us to how to treat DGs all the time. And sitting in a room with the metabolic geneticists from New Jersey, um, one will say one, one will say the other. We follow, we treat, et cetera. So, so we're trying to reduce false positives from the system and really just focus on our efforts on the babies who are truly, truly affected with classic galactosemia. And the reason for that is these false positives result in anxiety to the family and caregivers. That's across the board newborn screening, not just galactosemia screening. Uh, additional newborn screening testing and follow-up. So um, whether, you know, it could just simply be a repeat sent back to the laboratory, but that child has to go to the pediatrician, have a heel stick done again. Uh, the additional doctor visits and diagnostic testing. So there's a cost to that, and beyond monetary costs. You know, parents have to take days off from work. Um, doctors having to argue with insurance for, for doing diagnostic follow-up. And then finally, uh, the unnecessary cessation of potentially breastfeeding. And I will say that until um, my son Jonah was born a little over five years ago, I sort of didn't appreciate the importance of that. Um, I knew that it was, it was a critical bond, but... Um, seeing that how, how crucial that is, that, that became an important factor, at least for me in New Jersey, trying to figure out how to mitigate these false positive results. And so in 2013, as part of our annual quality improvement projects in the public health laboratory, we looked at how can we reduce false positives in the New Jersey Newborn Screening Laboratory. And we did a complete review of our cutoffs, the ones that I showed before, because adjusting your cutoffs is the easiest and fastest way to make an improvement to your system in the laboratory. Okay, we have too many false positives with 3.4. Let's drop the cutoff, and we'll have fewer false positives. And that's what we found. Um, the potential solution, which you probably can't see here, and I don't even see my data anymore, so I'll just put that down, um, is that we proposed to the metabolic geneticists in New Jersey that we drop the cutoff. The problem is, well, geneticists like diversity. We just heard a talk, oh, there's 4,000 novel variants to be found. Um, let's look for stuff. And so the geneticists go, well, we don't want to lose some of the Duartes that we find, even though we don't necessarily agree on how we're pursuing them. We like to see them. And so the recommendations from the specialists in New Jersey was, instead of lowering the cutoff, how about you pursue a genetic assay? Which was all fine and good, but we didn't have the, the manpower. At the time in 2013, I was the only one who was trained in molecular biology in our program. And so uh, clearly I was not in the lab all that often. And, and so that became one of our to-dos for the future. <clears throat> and the good news is uh, we took advantage of our recent mandated expansion to add lysosomal storage disorders and the need to do sequencing around uh, that expansion to add some more molecular biology. So we were able to hire a full-time molecular biologist in the newborn screening program as well as simultaneously recruit a postdoc paid for through the APHL and CDC um, postdoctoral research fellowship. And so Miriam is the postdoctoral research fellow. Dr. Alyssa McMillan is our full-time molecular biologist. And so Miriam took on this project while we waited for LSDs to come on board. And, and the GALT gene has well over 250 mutations that have been identified. We are, in an effort to get this up and running in an efficient and expeditious and cost-effective manner, we, we are, we've decided to look at the four most common mutations. And those are um, listed in the bottom you see here, the Q180R, the K285N, the S135L, and then that Duarte N314D mutation. And you can see the published frequencies, Q180R is by far the most common, um, and we see that, and I'll show the frequencies later of what we found in New Jersey. And on the right side, Miriam has put known as, and so, because it's easier to refer to these as colloquial D and G, Duarte D, G is a classic mutation. Um, and so, and I will lapse back and forth on the remaining slides between talking about the actual amino acid change as well as the, the colloquial term. And so it, it really can't get much simpler uh, than, than what we do. And it's simply that we have two, uh, it's a TACMAN real-time PCR assay where we're simply looking at, we have one probe that binds to the wild type and one that binds to the mutant for each of the four mutations. And so it's actually four different assays. If you, let's see, can you, yeah, let's see the pointer. It's on my hand. Um, so on the y-axis, you have the wild-type fluorescence. On the x-axis, you have mutant. So all those spots that are in the top left quadrant, those are all no mutation detected. 
Um, down right where you don't see any would be homozygous mutant, and then in the middle, uh, and sort of that sort of center to top right, are the um, one mutation detected. I won't say carrier because I don't know what the other genes are because this is simply one mutation that we're looking at. And in the bottom left are all our controls. So um, while this might look laborious, the idea here is we're trying to lower our false positives, so we're reducing our cutoff at the same time, but um, each row corresponds to one of the different four mutations, and each column is going to correspond to a patient. So we isolate DNA from the blood spot, um, four different assays are run simultaneously, and then the results are analyzed together. So uh, on the bottom you see that first row where Q180R, K285N, and S135L are all wild type. N314D says both alleles, so that is a wild type and also one mutant. So that baby we would report out as having one mutation, the Duarte mutation, N314D. It does not rule out other mutations, as I'll talk about in the assay limitations later, but um, at least we can report out that, that D. Uh, and then you see other examples below. The, the bottom line has the Q180R mutation and the N314D mutation, so that is reported out as a Duarte galactosemia. So having developed the assay, and this was mod that was modified from Washington State's assay that they shared with us, a different instrumentation, we embarked on a CLIA validation, highly sensitive assay down to one to a thousand dilution of DNA, very precise. Both Alyssa and Miriam ran the assay uh, multiple times over multiple days, and you can see the clustering of their results in the top right. We tested a variety of historic specimens that we received confirmed DNA back from the metabolic specialists. We accurately identified all of the knowns and then had a variety of other mutations that we didn't pick up, which is just as important. The assay was very specific to the four mutations we were looking for. And then we were, through the kindness of our colleagues in other states, we received some confirmed spots that were blinded from other states and correctly identified all those. So we were confident we had a very accurate uh, well-performing assay. This is the workflow and cutoff chart that led into the pilot study that I'll talk about. And, and again, top box left, if the GALT was greater than 4.4, we were done, no further follow-up. If it was less than 4.4, that specimen gets retested in duplicate. Um, if the average of the assay then comes above 4.4, you're normal. If it's between 3.4 and 4.4, there's a borderline, and then four, less than 3.4 is presumptive. That's all the way to the right in the red boxes. In the scope of this diagram, the red boxes are the babies who are getting sent to diagnostic follow-up. If a borderline specimen comes back in, it tests normal, we're done. If it tests abnormal again, it goes to diagnostic follow-up. So Miriam took on um, sort of what I guess we'll call an implementation pilot where she looked at all the babies in 2015 whose initial GALT value, value was less than 4.4. So it was a total of 158 specimens that were initially abnormal uh, at some level in 2015. And uh, Sue Berry once said, I put this slide up not, to, not for you to be able to see it, but to be impressed. And so that's why I put this up here, because Miriam did a hell of a lot of work. Um, so all the way, so the, the, the um, bottom of this chart is the GALT genotype that we determined in our laboratory. The uh, y-axis is the reported GALT enzyme activity. And you can see the lines, the borderline, that 4.4 cutoff, the presumptive PRE. 3.4 cutoff, and then the dotted line, which is LOD, is the limited detection for the assay. So by clear regs, the FDA insert for the kit does not allow us to report a value less than 2.5. So anything, any of the dots you see that's, that are below that 2.5 cutoff went out as just simply less than 2.5. Um, all the way on the right of this chart are the GGs, um, and you can see how low their GALT enzyme activity is, well less than the rest of the, the, the group. But every other column, there's some level of um, mutant detected, with the exception of all the way to the left, which were the, at least by our assay, no mutation detected. Um, the, the labels that are on the dots are the genetics that we received back from the metabolic specialists that they had done through private lab, um, you know, private lab genetic testing, somewhere between four and seven mutations that they would typically run. And for the most part, we matched. The ones that are in red, and I know they're hard to see, were discrepancies between what our follow-up program got back from the metabolic specialist and what we actually found when we did our DNA analysis. And we worked with our follow-up program to look at this, and a lot of them were based not on genetics but on biochemical. 
So some of the uh, metabolic genesis reporting back genotypes, but based on biochemical phenotype. And so one of the benefits we found of doing this assay, and the reason they did that was often because maybe insurance was not approving, um, was not approving the genetics in a timely fashion to get follow-up diagnosis back. And so that became an apparent benefit of doing this up front, which I'll talk about. And so, so this is a, a summarized version of what you just saw, which is what do we find? And, and the vast majority of the babies actually turned out to have no mutation detected, even regardless of enzyme activity. Um, again, that doesn't mean that there was no mutation, but they weren't one of the four most common mutations that we see in our population. Um, and on the bottom, you, it shows the, the, um, the frequency within the 158 that we saw. And so uh, on par, it's about the same. Our, our Duarte variant is a little bit higher than I think we expected and goes to why the metabolic geneticists wanted us to continue to do the, um, cont to, to implement metabolic testing as opposed, uh, mutation testing as opposed to just lowering the cutoff. And so we took this data back to the metabolic geneticists and we can add the, the DNA mutation analysis, but we can also lower the cutoff and improve our system greatly. And, and the reason I say this is on, this data now shows with 520 total abnormals, this goes back to when we first implemented our GSP assay back in 2011. So we had 520 um, total abnormals, and they were split evenly between the criticals and the borderline. So we had just as many babies going, being taken off breast milk or off, you know, dairy formula uh, as we did just having a repeat done, which is clearly a, an imbalance in our, in our reporting. And we suggested lowering our cutoff to 2.6, which would dramatically shift it would half the number of babies going to immediate diagnostic follow-up. Um, and then if you combine that with the genetics assay, you increase the power substantially. So we ended up with a new workflow where not only did we drop the presumptive cutoff to 2.6, but now all these babies are going to a metabolic geneticist with a basic level of DNA performed. Now, I mentioned the assay limitations. The assay only detects the four mutations that we selected. Um, anything, any, muta any mutations in the primer probe reason may lead to incomplete amplification. And also what we found is there's a five kilobase deletion of the GALT gene that completely <laughs> obliterates amplification. Now, the, the good news and bad news is that, uh, well, I'll start with the bad news is that we can't distinguish based on our current assay. The good news is Miriam's already developed a 5KB deletion assay that we're going to implement. And, and it's easy to find because you, it ends up showing as a homozygote. Um, so if a baby shows up, the, a baby will show up as a Q188R homozygote, whether they are a homozygote or have a 5KB deletion. So it's easy to, excuse me, pick these children up. And what we've seen during the pilot study data that I didn't show is that the 5KB deletion is just as common as the least common mutation in our assay. So, so there is incentive to add this, and, and that's coming online uh, sh uh, shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I said that this project really had an impact on the system, and that is, you know, so we, the first tenet was we didn't want to actually harm any baby by changing the process. So, the, so every classic galactosemia baby identified previously would still be identified with a new algorithm, as well as any of the Duartes. So we, simply, we really made no change in, ter in terms of the outcomes, outcome measures. However, those number of presumptive calls, so the workload on our follow-up program, the workload on our metabolic geneticist, is half, which is substantial. More importantly, the number of babies required, uh, so um, it does shift a, a burden to repeat, so the pediatricians will have to collect a greater number of repeat samples. However, it's likely that those children very well could show up normal down the road, which ends that diagnostic process or they shift into our mutation analysis. And so, in the end, any baby who's gonna to go to a metabolic geneticist with a gal an abnormal galactosemia screen in New Jersey will have a basic level of DNA mutation analysis performed, giving the physician an important piece of information headed, headed forward. And what I think Michelle's gonna talk about next is that brings equality to the system. So, no matter what insurance the child has or the family has, no matter what physician they see in the state, they have this continuity and similarity of their diagnostic, of their mutation analysis. And so um, it's, it's basically why we've gone forward with doing sequencing analysis for LSDs. It's a similar, similar, similar decision here. 
is that it's, it's public health, right? It's every child will have this opportunity. And, and I think that's somewhat a challenge to the notion of that, that separation between screening and diagnosis. Uh, but when we can add this test at low cost and low impact, it, it makes sense to bring that into our system. And so that's what we've done. And so this is my team in Jersey. And that's it. So.